The Tsunami Effect from 1 Kings Chapter 5 Naaman was successful. As mentioned, he was the highest military ranking officer. He had a huge track record in war victories and he was rich, deduced from what is said about his household. Of course, that was the template in those days. What similarities exist between the path to success in our day and then? I contend many trample underfoot, backstab, dedication, condescending. We deduce this from his suffering little children's contact gladly. 100% commitment in terms of national patriotism. Some are so dedicated they don't yapa, regardless of how hard it gets in their home country. And trust me, it does. To prove this, we have in the Western world both the wealthy as well as the falls from grace sorts. There are more similarities because things really do not change much, so we can say for certain Naaman employed these means to rise to the top, or maybe simply put, he was born into the ruling class. Now, many of us are dedicated to success, a career that we often chase, utilizing these methods of getting to the top, like Naaman. A few of us succeed, some are on the way, and others will achieve notable things, but I would like to band all these up into a phrase, the upward achievers. Naaman had a secret, a big secret, relating to his health. The type of health issue that is usually kept secret and, if revealed, can reduce one's social status and bring one down from a high horse of attitude. Ah, had they a slight inclination of his disease, had his secret been revealed, then there would start murmurs, then mumblings, and eventually, depending on which occurs first, physical debilitation or general knowledge, loss of authority, position, status, house, and eventually, life. A degradation on two fronts, physical and reputational. Of course, a man of his status may end up imprisoned in his home and not in the common colony. He may still advise on war strategy, but a loss of full honors loomed at an ever-quickening pace. This is such an allegory of our state before God, made perfect and communed with the Almighty given responsibility and war equipment from our enemy. War equipment, well, if we recall in the book of Genesis that creation had underlying the evil one, watching, seeking ways to subvert and damage. What else is that if not war? Doesn't destruction and pain and death follow war, partner alongside it? Ask any soldier returning from war if you care to hear horrors, if he or she will tell, despite the glamour that somewhat surrounds this event. I saw two pictures of a man before and after he went to war. It was annotated. Before he looked at you, after he looked through you, same person. Oh, how we are tainted, marred, disfigured, so ugly with sin and the degradation of soul and body affected by sin and the effects of the sinful state of man. The soul, dead to God's promptings and communication, and the body, approaching death daily from the very day we are born. No human could relieve or cure this disease, and I am sure not for lack of trying. We see this in the activities, money and gifts collection, approach to dignitaries, suggesting that the elite always had access to the latest information about anything that ensued when a cure was suggested. Again, we see the size of the gifts made and may be led to think it is a one-off, because usually the rich, yes, they had control of the realm and seemingly limitless resources, get richer by hoarding and stinginess. We also know this incurability of the disease from history. No one could stem its advancing damages. Oh, maybe let's preserve what is left, halt the degeneration. No, it is fatal. Once it hits, it stops at nothing but the death of the carrier. It is also grotesque, painful and damaging, so it was a dreaded disease. No one trifled with it. Everyone understood these about it, even a child. It caused families, loved ones, to be separated. Oh, we could go on. The quarters allocated to carriers were almost tomb-like. Carriers had to shout when they approached anyone. A scavenger resorted to begging to survive as their ability to work diminished as the disease advanced. Though without hope, yet they needed sustenance. Not all their faculties were extinguished at once, but eroded gradually. 
They could think, carry, eat, and so on. They were the dead walking. Now the aptness of this as a synonym, the similarities for our spiritual state, is genius and can only be God-given as much of a miracle as creation itself. Anyhow, we know that creation and maintenance are considered one long creation, don't we? These needn't be respelt out, but to reiterate, no man, doctor, or psychologist can cure us of sin. No amount of money can buy our salvation. No king can decree that we go to heaven. Sin is an increasingly damaging thing. We harden as we age. The more the miseries of life, the more we curse and hate God. Everyone, even a child, knows about sin, that it is wrong and ugly in God's sight. Though sinners, we still have some capacity for fleshly good or charity. We can love, enjoy music, care for children, society, eat, grow, and work at various professions. Our natural state is cursed and almost tomb-like compared to our future heavenly state or destination, for the redeemed, that is. Our existence is arduous. By sweat, work, and blood, birth, we live. And with these faculties, we can listen to a message and understand to the stage that we call out with faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. I spent too long on these preambles not having touched on my main topic, the power of smallness. There is a Yoruba saying, but I am sure it has similarities in many other languages. In English, maybe stoop to conquer is close, and it goes like this. The young's hand cannot reach the top shelf, whilst the elder's hand cannot fit into the mouth of a gourd. There are cultures where the child is ignored, hence that exhortation to warn that a child should be heard. Now this Bible passage may hint at toddlers or small children. However, the general belief is that this young maiden was between 12 and 15, which may stem from the generally accepted practice of the time that slaves had to be old enough to offer some service or do chores. And personally, I read this in, that she made this comment amid carrying out her chore. Just a hunch I have. However, she could well have said this in the slave quarters depending on the stricture of the household. Regardless of when or how it was said, the faith, compassion, and the willingness to propagate the living God in a pagan country, oh, and how pagan that place was, so much so that after conversion it was utmost in the general's mind, is unmissable. The bravery of her, that quiet strength that sometimes mingled with innocence is so, so beautiful and admirable. We mustn't forget her selflessness. A slave from Israel, others would sulk and complain at their lot, comparing to the freedom and lushness of their homeland, would wickedly withhold such information. But then to such, aren't part of this discussion, belong to another article. We also look at the brevity of her statement. She wrote no epistle, nor did she seek favors. Oh, if I am released, I can tell how the master can get a cure. I dare to suggest here spontaneity stemmed from a heart of love for the godless to know the power of the living God. I don't believe she was released, speculating either. I guess you may say of that, we are all ungrateful beings deep down and arrogant. If they thought, oh, she is better off in Syria than Israel, they been the conqueror, the victor, and she from the vanquished land, Naaman said as much to the prophet. Anyhow, I am sure she doesn't deserve to be burdened with renown, so I will be as brief about her as she was in her status and comment. What more can I say? Had we such a mind as hers toward the lost? I again reiterate humility, simplicity as a child not seeking accolade or renown due to our acumen, oratory skills, station or status in life. A heart of love towards the plight of the lost, bravery with prayerfulness to be able to mention Christ and his saving power to the blighted and lost. Maintaining our innocence, not ignorantly but in wisdom, avoiding pollutants for our soul, the ways and wantonness of the worldling, like the wickedness of Gehazi who was only for self, is not once named amongst us. And if so named, is repented with all alacrity, not seeking filthy lucre, to advance our lots, at the expense of seizing opportunities to propagate the gospel. There is no other explanation to the extent of the response to her statement. Just a reminder we don't have her name, but we have God's acknowledgement of her in this episode second only to the prophet himself in the terms aforementioned, but also in the ensuing galvanization of the main players of the two nations until General Naaman's encounter with the prophet 
the culmination in this narrative starting from the exhortation of the little girl, and we can call it that, exhortation. Let's briefly elaborate this. It was told to the mistress of the house, well, it seems she is a tower in that household and so must all wives. I slipped this in here. She seems very concerned and discreet as we harped on before this disease was still contained within the inner circle of the household and you ask, how come the little girl or may I address her as young lady knew about it? To me, it is another confirmation of her faith and her knowledge of scripture, as opposed to being a snoop busybody who goes around peeping through keyholes. She understood the scriptures and its stipulation about stages of the disease. Let's humor the skeptics a little. Maybe she was the daughter of a priest, and she knew it was real as opposed to false alarm. Anyhow, back to my point. Alacrity ensued, the pace and rumpus of it. I guess the time duration from her statement to the prophet's encounter must have been less than a week, accounting for travel using the fastest possible mode of transport. You know the narrative well. Healed, but not quite there yet humility-wise humbled by God an example of salvation, as in all healing miracles of Christ's show the way souls are redeemed from this world of iniquity. Naaman was concerned for witness, generous, but some worldliness still remains. A combination of sinner saints is our state until Shiloh comes. He believed Gehazi, sure he is not naive, certainly did not become a general without understanding the slay of men, but lurking in his mind still is the susceptibility of man to wealth, perhaps to be his besetting sin, for hardly shall a rich man be saved. Beware of this drive and ferocity, especially the present speaker, to pursue wealth. Do it with great care, think more about occupation than heaping wealth to your name, and yes, earn as much as you can but give also to the work as the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Gehazi, despite the Transformation Act, in his very presence, remained in his apostate state. He couldn't see beyond this world, therefore did not believe anyone would reject such riches. Can you imagine the torment he underwent between Elisha's refusal and his devising that plan to go after Naaman? His covetousness must have run riot, burning with desire for such, or a share of such, wealth. Thinking on it, scheming what he would do with it if he had it. An Israelite who displayed behavior worse than the Syrians. How true this of us we hanker, yearn, plot, scheme after worldly good ignoring our eternal home. The miracle was from out of this world, but he did not see it nor caution his raging appetite. This also proves that it takes God's power and will to redeem the outer ordinances does not save a man. He cannot change himself. Talk less of changing another man, the leprosy stuck to Gehazi as sin, sticks to the unrepentant leprosy or sin and awful fate of unbelief, we see here a final judgment. No mention ever of repentance earned his wage, sin, death, damnation. Don't be surprised if so-called Christians behave worse than worldlings in matrimonial home place of work, place of study field of play and so on. They probably exhibit their true colors that they were never saved in the first place. Let us beware that this be untrue of us, that we examine ourselves diligently, frequently, and to be sure we are Christ's and part of his glorious and non-ephemeral blessings.